le quedan en carne eso. Hello, testing, hello, hello.
Hello, I check. 3, 2, 1, 1, 2, 3. Hello. So I think we can begin. May I request the panelists to please come up on this chairs. Pakistan. 
Uh, we greatly value your presence here today and appreciate the interest and engagement of our partners from government, civil society, the international community and the media. I'm particularly grateful to Mr. Raza Rumi, editor of the Friday Times and executive director of the Justice Network, who graciously agreed to facilitate the conversation today and to our panelists for having accepted the invitation to engage in this summit. Uh, on Sunday, September the 22nd, the 2013 Social Good Summit launched in New York and is currently taking place in more than 55 countries across the globe. As the UN General Assembly convenes for its annual meeting, this year's Social Good Summit theme is 2030 Now, which will challenge participants to share solutions, ideas and innovations with a central look at what needs to be done now to pave the way for a better world in 2030. This summit is the only space during the UN week that gives anyone sitting anywhere a seat at the table. This year, the Social Good Summit is asking the development community on what direction should new development efforts take once the target date of the MDGs has been reached in 2015. Access to new technologies remains a core challenge for developing countries, a view that is also shared in the Millennium Development Goals themselves, as reflected in the content of Goal 8, Target 18. This year's theme, 2030 Now, will focus on efforts that people everywhere can be making now to combat poverty and improve livelihoods around the world by 2030. At the same time, we're also very pleased to inform you of the launch of the new UNDP Pakistan website. This website comprises project information presented in a searchable, transparent fashion uh, and is the start of a growing and evolving web presence for UNDP in Pakistan and UNDP worldwide. Last year, UNDP hosted more than 40 social good summit meetups in countries across the globe. Building on last year's success, 55 UNDP country offices around the world will host local conversations, bringing together governments, local leaders, NGO organizers, civil society, entrepreneurs, UN officials, and many more. Countries as diverse and far-flung as Afghanistan, Nicaragua, the Philippines, Rwanda, and Zimbabwe are all participating in what promises to be one of the largest conversations of its kind. Together, they will contribute to the global conversation about global problems using the social media to raise awareness and drive action. The outcomes will be fed back to the post-2015 consultations and agenda. So this is also your chance as participants to add to those conversations and those outcomes. The Social Good Summit 2013 promises to be a crucial forum for debate and ideas around how we can work together to build a better world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rosalini, and uh, I think I'll, I'll just uh, uh, we'll start uh, with the panel, but before I do that, I just want to make a few uh, remarks on, uh, I mean, Pakistan's development challenges are well known, and in terms of social indicators, it fares uh, uh, well below many of the regional countries, despite high periods of economic growth in the past. And uh, in, in particular, over the last uh, five to six years, it has gone through a stagflationary phase where we've, uh, we've seen unprecedented inflationary trends, plus low economic growth rate, and uh, very uh, modest improvements in social indicators. Uh, that story is, is well known, but alongside, there's a new Pakistan, which is, which is also kind of unveiling uh, itself and, un, uh, uh, and, 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 and taking shape. And that uh, comes with the rise of citizen uh, journalism, uh, of, of the popularity of new media, the penetration of the internet, and the rise uh, and the uh, huge uh, numbers of telephone, uh, mobile telephone uh, penetration uh, across the country. We have nearly 130 million or so telephone connections in, in Pakistan. Uh, almost 20% uh, or so of the population has some form of uh, internet access, which if you translate in numbers, is rather huge. Um, over 930 towns are now connected uh, uh, through the internet, as well as, uh, if I want to cite some of the popular sites used, uh, nearly 8 million 
Pakistanis are on the Facebook and over between two to three million, and these are old figures, I'm, I'm, I'm a little uh, out of date on that front, so uh, maybe three million are, are on Twitter. So, ha uh, of course, these are very urban-centric, uh, and uh, much, of it, much of that happens in Pakistan's towns and big cities. But what it does um, enable is a new form of uh, accountability emerging uh, towards the accountability of the state, of politicians, of, of political parties. And we saw in the 2013 elections recently how the social media influenced uh, electoral patterns, particularly in the urban centers, and how citizens, especially the younger population of Pakistan, uh, was able to express its uh, 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 particular uh, um, political and other priorities through the use of uh, social media. I think the other dynamic uh, which is also uh, taking place uh, pertains to the uh, sort of unprecedented uh, moment of a young population. Pakistan, nearly two-thirds of Pakistan is below the age of 29 or so, and in a, in a decade or so, the majority of Pakistanis would be below the age of 26. Uh, the third important dynamic that is uh, uh, taking place in Pakistan uh, pertains to, uh, again, a women's uh, participation in the uh, workplace, uh, which is a result of uh, their uh, increased uh, numbers in higher education. Uh, nearly half of Pakistan's public sector universities students are women, and in certain big university campuses, 70 to 80 percent student body is women. So I think all of these dynamics are pretty under-researched and understudied. What, what is happening in Pakistan in a nutshell is that the society is transforming and evolving at a very fast pace. In a, uh, and the state, which uh, 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 sadly uh, operates on a kind of a 19th century colonial framework and rules of business, etc., is, is slow to adapt to these changes. So you have a kind of a, a, a attention going on in Pakistan, which sometimes reflects uh, in, in the way technology platforms are used, they are, they are distributed, they are consumed, and the way they articulate sizes and societies. I'll stop here and I'll uh, invite uh, Tyler Mohsen, the correspondent for CNN, to make a few remarks on uh, how she views uh, the rise of new media and technology, and particularly in her work for CNN, uh, how has that uh, shaped um, the whole interaction.
Um, and CNN International does have a very strong social media presence via Facebook, via Twitter. We have more than, uh, I'm going to have to read this because I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, CNN Breaking News has more than 13 million followers on Twitter. CNN has 10 million and CNN International has more than 1 million followers. So there's a, a lot of dialogue going on there. Um, Facebook, we have more than 5 million likes on our CNN Facebook page. Um, and just to clarify, as a journalist, social media and this kind of interaction really has transformed the way I operate and the way my colleagues operate when we're on the ground, when we're sitting in our newsrooms. You know, we really get an insight about people's opinions, their experiences, and get to connect, and, and it's great. Uh, but of course, being responsible journalists, all that traffic and information that comes our way, we do have to verify it. And, and you know, so CNN does have a huge social media administrative committee that brings all that in, brings all that traffic in, and, and then we verify, source, fact check everything before we put it back out. Um, and one of, one of the best interactive shows I feel that CNN has, that we have, and, and it's a tool that we use to connect with communities right across the world, is CNN I Report. So I'm sure many of you have heard of it or, or seen it. And that is where, as Rosa said, we've seen a lot of uh, citizen journalism, and, and we really like to get that in from people across the world to share their views, share what they're seeing with us. Um, and it was launched seven years ago, and it's become hugely popular, uh, and it just shows just how much communities, no matter where they are, really do have a voice, and they want to share it, and they come through platforms like CNN to share it with a wider audience. Um, and, and so CNN users basically are allowed, for those of you who haven't seen it, to upload photographs, videos, and even make specific eye reports and, and share that with us. Um, and, and for myself, for my part as a journalist, it really helps me as well, not just get stories, but understand where people are coming from, gain perspectives, and, and then share perspectives and, check, and perhaps shape a conversation. And I think that's where social good, um, perhaps some of you might feel it's ideological, but social good can come from journalism. Whether it is investigating a story, exposing a story, or just sharing a perspective. So that someone sitting in Alabama can connect with someone sitting in Lahore, Pakistan, or someone in the Smart Valley is telling their story to someone sitting in Winchester in the UK. And I feel that that really can happen. And, and, and and I hope that my position here in Pakistan is to bring in that perspective on Pakistan to viewers around the world. Uh, and we've seen, of course, through journalism, how social media has really formed and shaped um, uh, the Arab Spring. We've seen that through our reporting on CNN. We've seen how um, the rigging uh, issue during the elections was uh, very much talked about by social media. Um, and, and through stories that I've covered too, I've seen the good that can come of both technology and social media and that interaction within communities. I, I recently did a story just last week in the hall, um, which was fantastic because I'm always learning too. It was about Pakistan's tech talent and I met so many amazing young entrepreneurs through this gentleman sitting next to me here. And, um, and we discovered all sorts of apps and products based on modern technology that are being developed for social good out in the field. Um, I think I might talk a bit more about that later, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop myself here. But certainly I've seen through my reporting how, how people are working on social good using technology, which we'll explore later, and how I think journalism can really be used and, and modern tools like social media can help organisations like CNN connect with communities around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. That was very interesting. Uh, I think social good is perhaps a, 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 a kind of bigger and more complex term, but surely in Pakistan many public goods are being distributed through technological innovations like the Benazir income support for program, the cash transfers, which go to millions, almost seven, mil seven to nine million households through uh, the use of uh, 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 the, the ID cards that NASA has issued and through biometric te technology. 
Similarly, after the two disasters of 2010 and 2011, a lot of uh, relief to uh, the victims of disaster was also handed through uh, smart cards, and that cut, cut a lot of red tape and made the process efficient. I mean, Pakistan came out of a very major disaster in 2010 when a lot of people had, had sort of estimated that you know the country may not get out of it. But I think there were some innovative solutions which came uh, to the rescue of Pakistan. And I think on that uh, particular note on, on how uh, innovation and technology is contributing to improve service delivery, I think Uber Saif, uh, who is another panelist of ours, uh, can speak a lot because he has pioneered some of these products in the Punjab province. Uh, which are gaining more, more and more traction, both in terms of social services and in other areas, and we'll hear from him on that. Thank you, Raza. I was going to talk about my government work, but let me start off by uh, uh, by talking about two little projects that I started when I was still a professor at um, and they are similar to what uh, Saima had alluded to uh, in, in, in our five minutes. Um, the, the two things that I think I started that have sort of inspired confidence in the use of technology, especially mobile phones, uh, in bringing the social good, so to speak. Uh, one was a uh, one was a sort of a citizen journalism service that we started towards the end of the Musharraf times. Uh, the media was totally banned in Pakistan. There was basically no news coming out of Pakistan, and the lawyers had taken to this long march. Uh, and, and, and everything was banned. You could just find basically no images, nothing coming out of Pakistan at that point in time. Uh, so myself and a couple of my TAs uh, put together a website literally in an afternoon called See and Report uh, and, and bought cell phones for some of the activists who were going on this long march and, 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 and showed them how to MMS images from their mobile phones for this website where they would get instantly published. Uh, this very quickly became the largest citizen journalism network in Pakistan and led to lots of citizen journalism services that all run on that platform now. The most prominent being GeoDost, which is Geo's uh, citizen journalism initiative. Uh, it collects a lot of content from citizens and makes stories out of it. It also run a half an hour segment every week uh, from uh, user generated content from stories that citizens report. Uh, it's very useful. They get lots of you know, footage of bomb blasts, protests, so on and so forth, that otherwise journalists cannot capture, but someone just happens to be on the street and can take a picture and send, the, send that in. Uh, Samar TV was also running uh, their citizen journalism service on the same platform called Ali Samar, and so on and so forth. So I think uh, when, when this was in Vogue, and this was about, about a year, year and a half ago, uh, so we had about seven TV channels, uh, including a couple in the Middle East who were all using the citizen journalism platform. It started out like an afternoon project for a couple of people uh, in the university. The other thing that we started was... Uh, the other thing that we uh, that we started uh, uh, at LAMP was, uh, was a little before LAMP was at the end of the 2005 earthquake uh, that we had in Pakistan and I happened to be visiting Pakistan at that point. So I went up north wanting to help and, and you know, I certainly wasn't in any shape to do that when I, I came. But I very quickly figured out that I could help by using some sort of technology. Uh, and and, and, and the, I think the fundamental problem at that point was the lack of coordination between different uh, donor agencies. Uh, uh, there were lots of people from different parts of the world wanting to help, all speaking different languages. They had, they had no way to connect with each other. Uh, there was certainly no Twitter or Facebook available at that point, uh, you know, where all of that activity was taking place. Uh, so I connected a cell phone uh, to my laptop and started using it as a modem. And brought and widely publicized my cell phone number and asked people to send an SMS and to be broadcast to everyone who had subscribed to this SMS channel or a broadcast list, a mailing list. And, and, and in about three days that I stayed there, I think we had about 14,000 SMSs go through that, uh, uh, that, that little thing that I read together. And that was certainly more impact than I had for six years of my research at MIT. <laughs> so I was very impressed <laughs> with the small solution that I took. And then I finally moved back to Pakistan and, and, and we, we made that uh, into a little service that we started using for auditing quizzes and, and announcements and class schedules and so on at LAMP. It was called Chopal at the time. It is now called SMS or it's Pakistan's largest SMS network. Uh, we have over 7 million users of this network now. Uh, uh, all the major political parties use this as the tool to connect with their board bank. 
I think in rounds about 70 percent of the entire World Bank electricity like registered on SMSR, uh, which is interesting given that I work for government print. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but but also I think all the other all the other major political parties have their vote banks registered on this, and they use it very effectively uh, uh, for people to get out of their homes and vote on the election day. And then they also turned it to IVR services and so on and so forth. There's a whole sort of technology play that went into the election business leading up to 2013, and PTI was certainly using technology very effectively, including the SMS platform that we built. Uh, so so much for social good. Uh, that, that we did before I took up this government job. But this government job, one of the, uh, one of the things that has been of, you know, moderately successful is the use of smartphones instead of uh, PCs uh, for automating government uh, work. Uh, the government, as uh, you, you, would, you would know, spends billions of rupees buying personal computers for civil servants. Uh, except that you, know, you buy a computer for a civil servant and typically they're not keen to use it. Uh, it requires a separate room with some air conditioning, uh, an internet connection, some uninterrupted power supply. All of those are serious challenges in a country like Pakistan. So it never really happens. You, know, you spend billions buying computers and internet connectivity and UPSs and, and, and getting assistance for these guys who can type and, and print and so on and so forth. But it never really happens. Uh, so that's the problem that I confronted when I took up this job. I have now had all public sector IT initiatives in government of Punjab. And, uh, and, and the thing that we started focusing on was to somehow try and exploit the cell phone, a smartphone, as my tool for bringing some degree of automation. Uh, and now we use it quite effectively in many departments, but I wanted to give you one concrete example. And that was our uh, uh, anti dengue system, which has had some press you may have heard of it before. But what we did was to buy 1,500 smartphones, Android phones. And these are cheap phones. You could buy one for 100 bucks these days. Uh, so I bought about 1,500 of these phones and started writing applications for these smartphones, Android phones, and literally gave out to all of our field formations, field workers, who were doing activities to prevent another epidemic. Punjab was hit with a really bad epidemic in 2011. We had 21,000 confirmed patients, 17,000 from the hall, and don't and 50 people died. If this was a pandemic by any scale. We weren't prepared to handle this. So we wanted to avert in the epidemic in 2011. Uh, that's when I took up my in 2012. That's when I took up my job, and, and we started giving out these smartphones and asked our field workers that wherever you go and perform any prevention activity, any containment activity to avert an any 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 epidemic, I do take a picture of it. And instead of taking your camera to take a picture, take my smartphone along, take a picture of it, and submit it using my application. It automatically get your tapped and get time stamped on my servers. You can't forge, you can't fake that activity. So I know that you actually went there and did something useful. And, 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 and there's you know thousands of people running around wanting to help, you know, in government in different departments, seventeen different government departments, forest, agriculture, livestock, whatnot, all wanting to do something or pretending to do stuff that will avert in that epidemic. So now they were all equipped with these smartphones and they could track their progress. So I gave out these smartphones. What you see there is this is a I'm a college professor after all, so there has to be something very good. Uh, so that's our that's a map of Lahore. So we gave out these smartphones uh, to these guys, and I asked them to take a picture every time they perform a prevention or a containment activity. And this is what I got in the first week actually, about five pictures. Uh, but clearly, you know, so we wanted them to use smartphones, they had never used them before and so on. But I very quickly figured out, you know, even with that moderate success. That you know this device has inherent advantages. It doesn't require an uninterrupted power. It always it has an always on network connectivity. It has some social value embedded in it. So you could call your family, your friends, you could receive calls on it and so on. And your children can play games on it, so smartphone and so on. So you would take care of this phone, right? So most people sort of took care of this phone and used it personally as opposed to the PCs that I was buying them. So at the end of the dengue season, this is how the hard looked like. There wasn't an inch of law that wasn't covered in prevention activities. And that was all photographed and tracked using smartphones. Actually, the overall number of these activities is about 200,000. So we got 200,000 different pictures of different prevention activities that performed in year 2012-13 to avert another epidemic. So no wonder we haven't had in the dengue epidemic. So this was massive amounts of work by different departments. This is the kind of pictures that they were submitting. You could see the here in the government, Lahore, who took this picture, where, and so on. The activity is IRS, which means they went to someone's house who had contacted dengue and was doing a residual spray. This is an IRS spray. This is part of the protocol. And, and they took a picture of it and submitted it. And these are all different pictures. If you, you, could, you could close that pop-up. Uh, and, and maybe zoom out. I'm going to 
go for a broke and see if you can zoom out, huh? Uh, okay, let's see if we can zoom out. The network connection wasn't very far apart here. Uh, that was Lahore, and this is how Punjab looked like. So it wasn't just Lahore where this work was being performed or craft. Uh, the, the black lines uh, are, are the division boundary in Punjab, the nine divisions that we have. And so this was happening in all large cities, uh, and, 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 and it's, as, as eventually being institutionalized. This is now how government of Punjab does work. They carry smartphones and help us track their activities. And some of their performance and so on and so forth is, is evaluated based on that. We now use it for lots of things. Um, but by the way, this health business has gone further, and now we track all 26 notifiable disease in Punjab. Uh, we have a real-time disease surveillance network in Punjab, uh, which is important because God forbid if he had an epidemic or an infectious disease, then he's not infectious disease. If I could sneeze and pass it on to you, it is an epidemic that can totally get out of hand very quickly. So we wouldn't even know what to quarantine and contain. So now we had, uh, so now we're disease, tracking all 26 diseases, and for that we use this SMS wheel. I brought a little contraption with me. This works a lot like a pregnancy wheel if you've seen one. You align some information here and spits out a unique ID here. So you line up the day of the month, the disease, and the number of cases coming through. It spits out a nine-digit unique ID which you SMS to us. And this is what now goes on in different hospitals, basic health units, rural health centers. And from that I can extract how many disease cases of different diseases were reported in different places. This is again using smartphones. We use it in all uh, uh, big government departments, especially the line, the, the, the seven large line departments, agriculture, livestock, education, so on, but also police. I hope that map has loaded up. Uh, let's see, no, it hasn't. But we also do now do this in with police, where we are tracking crime in real time in Lahore, starting from Lahore, and identifying crime hotspots where policing can change from a patrolling business to you know sort of increasing search places where you actually have crime hotspots and so on. But we use it for teacher attendance. We use it for uh, livestock, EDO visits, so on and so forth. So we're not using it, you know, sort of as sort of the tool for automating, monitoring, tracking, uh, coming progress. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you very much. Um, let's uh, move on to Mr. Agran Mir, uh, who, is, who works for the United Bank Limited Group, and he can perhaps talk about the branch of banking and, the, and how technology is enabling uh, banking for the poor and low income groups. Thank you, Rosa. <coughs> Uh, I guess when we talk about the use of technology for poverty reduction, one of the biggest uh, use that one can do is to improve the financial inclusion, which remains a huge challenge in this country at the moment. And everybody in the world is talking about the benefits that can come out of increasing the financial inclusion. So it was with that objective that uh, UBL being uh, one of the largest banking institutions obviously was looking at it from a commercial perspective and we thought that there was an opportunity for us to go out and increase our spread as well as increase the number of customers that we have and the kind of services we provide to a different segment out there that we were not able to tap into using our existing branch network which is sizable considering it's about 1300 plus branches but still that's not enough to cover a large segment of the population. So it's with that idea that we started uh, the concept of UBL Omni, which is a branchless banking. Uh, within UBL, we developed our own technology platform, so it's all in-house based technology. What we do is we facilitate the consumers to go to retail locations. There are more than 15,000 of those that are providing these services on our behalf in Pakistan today. Uh, the consumers can use mobile phone, they can use uh, card, they can use IVR, so they get multiple channels to interact with the bank and to store their money and to do their financial transactions. But that was what we thought we were entering into. As it turned out, uh, 2009 end was it, I believe, Government Pakistan had conducted a military operation in Sawat, where there were a couple of hundred thousand families who were displaced, and then as they were going back, Government Pakistan wanted to give than the cash that needed to be given to them for resettlement and all that. Um, but the biggest challenge was how to go about giving that money in a transparent and an efficient manner. It was at that point that we bumped into a gentleman who was sitting here in the audience, Karmedi from Nadra. He facilitated our meeting with the then chairman Nadra and we floated the idea that you know we could facilitate the distribution of uh, ATM cards 
if Nadra could provide work with us and you know facilitate the biometric authentication, uh, we'll teach people how to use a ATM card, we'll teach people how to use a POS machine and we'll teach them how to use that to get the money out. There was a lot of skepticism around that. People told us we had lost our marbles and it was going to be a huge disaster. But I'm glad that all the key stakeholders decided to go ahead with that experiment. And from that day onward, there was no looking back. Uh, after the success of that program, 2010 floods, again we partnered with all the provincial governments and Madra and we distributed the largest amount of cards uh, called the Vatan cards for the beneficiaries who again were able to go out and get money from various ATMs as well as from retail locations. Then Benazir Income Support Program also converted to these smart cards and today we have a couple of million beneficiaries who are already receiving their money through these cards. Uh, but then this was one part of the, the uh, you know, this was like disaster related or social protection related uh, activities that we were doing. That's when we started interacting with the donor community as well. So first one to come on board was the World Food Program who decided to move forward to convert from cat from instead of giving food they moved on to cash for work kind of initiatives. So that's where we started to convert a lot of the World Food Program disbursements through our network. Then subsequently UNDP also came in and that's where we, we did some very interesting project with UNDP. We developed a customized application for them whereby there were these hand pumps that were being installed in KPK and we digitized the whole payment cycle so there was no physical cash being given. The UNDP's account was opened and from that point onward the vendor would, the, the contractor would actually go, they would use our app, they would take the photograph, the photograph would come back along with the GPS coordinates and time and date stamps and that would allow the person sitting at the back end to authenticate that this was a genuine photograph and that would allow him to authorize payments digitally. The payments would be then transferred into the accounts of the laborers that we set up and these accounts were again set up at these retail locations and these were all paperless accounts. And the guys would then go to the retail locations and they would withdraw money from that end. From that point onward then uh, last year World Health Organization also moved uh, to start using our network for the payments of uh, the stipend to the polio vaccinators who go out and who administer polio vaccinations. So we're providing that coverage to those entities as well. So we're seeing a lot of interest from the donor community as well who are also moving towards leveraging the technology that is available out there. That was, another, and then we saw another segment that, that came about that was the microfinance segment because the microfinance has a huge challenge that in terms of the reach that they cannot afford to scale up they cannot afford to expand their reach. So we have enabled them by, by providing our retail agent network to be their extended uh, uh, distribution infrastructure whereby they are now using the loan repayments from consumers and some of them have already started to use our network for the disbursements of small ticket loans as well. So, so all of this has been a very interesting experience and a journey for us and none of these were the things that we had actually envisaged when we started out initially. And from a social perspective, what we see is that it's not only facilitating uh, transparent and efficient distribution, it's also facilitating and creating education around the use of financial instruments to a large segment. And we're talking millions out here. It's also enabling a large amount of these small retailers or other small uh, you know, scale investors who have a couple of thousand rupees on them but they really don't know what to do with that so they can come in and become our agents and they can start earning their livelihood as well. So, so it's the use of the mobile phone and the web based services that we've used to enable these agents to provide variety of services and just to give you an idea of the scale that we have managed to achieve in the last one half three years uh, when we talk about all of these G2P and uh, donor community projects we have facilitated more than 7 million transactions worth about a billion dollars depending upon what exchange rate you use for rupee to dollar parity. Uh, essentially, I mean, that's all that I have at this point in time. I think I would rather let the audience come back with the questions and then we can take it from there. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And uh, we'll move to Saad Hamid, uh, who uh, is well known to those who follow the TEDx, uh, various TEDx events, and also as a young uh, social media guru. <laughs> uh, thank you, Raza. Um, so uh, my social good journey actually started from self good. Uh, and I'm going to actually tell you a little bit about how it all started. So it was back in 2007, uh, which was almost I think six years ago, and I was just 18 at that time. I was in my second semester of my university, and I was going through a phase that normal youngster would, the you know, studies and all of that. And then Steve Job comes in, and he you know releases the first iPhone, and I wanted to use that iPhone in Pakistan, so I went online and discovered how to unlock unlock that iPhone. Uh, there was the, the technique that I learned online was the first time that I went online to use a tutorial uh, to actually use it for a real life need. Uh, so I thought why not use the same tutorial and post it on my own blog and you know see what happens. So I did that and uh, starting from there you know the rest is history. Because I started making a lot of money and that's where the whole social media thing started for me. But that's the self-good part. The actual part comes after that, and that's the social good part. So down uh, the, uh, over the couple of years, over uh, after three years uh, of my blogging career, um, I, did, I discovered this thing called TED, and and, and I went crazy about it. it. It was all about technology, entertainment, and design, all about the great ideas that people wanted to share. And the best part was that you know anyone could start a TEDx platform in their city. Uh, so I decided to start one in Islamabad and that's how it all started. Uh, I, I personally discovered TikToks and TEDx through social media and I decided to start a TEDx platform in Islamabad and that's exactly what we did back in 2010. Uh, for me, uh, TED always was about the ideas, it, all, it still is all about the ideas but the real joy I get from being a TEDx organizer for the local community and how it is related to social good is I get to meet a lot of amazing people. I get to uh, talk to a lot of people, I get to uh, connect a lot of amazing people. And that's what TEDx has been all about for us in Pakistan so far. Uh, if you talk about how we are using it as a tool for social good, uh, we, we try our best to connect people uh, so they can sit down and discuss uh, ideas and you know take them forward in any way. And for me, TEDx is, has always been about possibilities, uh, about what uh, you know I can achieve uh, through such a platform. So the first time, uh, this was also back in 2010, I decided to do uh, TEDx uh, in in, uh, in one of the biggest cinemas in Rawalpindi, Sambad. It's called Cinepass. And you know, uh, it, it was really interesting and it was actually quite challenging for us uh, because people did not even know what TEDx and TED is. And so I, you know, I went to the owner of the cinema and I uh, asked him politely that he is going to, you know, shut down his cinema for six hours so I can do a TEDx event there. Uh, it was really hard to convince him, but at the end of the day, I well managed to do it. And we got an audience of 500 people and we asked them to come to a cinema to well enjoy a TEDx event. Uh, and that's how we uh, started this whole thing. Over a couple of years, uh, over a couple of years, we have done a lot of TEDx interventions in a lot of different and new places. Uh, one of them was uh, Peri Kiran School. It's in the outskirts of Islamabad. It's a school for the underprivileged community, and uh, the children there they could not even speak Urdu, so it was really hard to tell them what TEDx and ideas are all about. Uh, but we somehow managed to, uh, you know, make such a program that we were able to tell them about all the amazing things uh, related to TED and generally about ideas. Uh, the second amazing thing that we did was uh, TEDx City 2.0. It happened back in 2012, October 2012, and uh, and the idea was to get people from social, uh, not just from social media, but to use social media as a platform to get people from Oran, Islamabad, and Lahore, and Karachi, and uh, other cities for that matter, and you know, ask them to come and present their ideas for urban innovation. Uh, the 